Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Gary Mitchell, the founder of the Manufacturing Connection, and you can find me at themanufacturingconnection.com. Let's start quickly by looking at the screen and familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with it. Uh, if you take a look at through around, you'll find the chat tool. You can click on that and you can tell us where you're located and just chat back and forth. If you have questions for us, and at the end of this session, we will answer as many questions as possible, please use the Q&A tool, not the chat tool. And before we get started, let's uh, take a look at some upcoming events from IIoT World. On November 16th, they have Analytics at the Edge, and on December 7th, I I IOT World Manufacturing and Supply Chain Day, which I'm sure will be fantastic, a lot of information. This track runs for 58 minutes, and we'll have time, you'll have time at the end to switch over and go to the next session in this track. And that one is called Include Industrial Metaverse Features in Your Existing IoT Platform. It wouldn't be possible to run this virtual conference without sponsors. And we have a big thank you to our sponsors, GE Digital, Intel, Hitachi Bonterra, Ursa Leo, and Siemens. And then a word about the host of this uh, conference, IIoT World. IIoT World is the leading authority on industrial IoT. IIoT World is a digital media outlet bringing the latest industrial Internet of Things, virtual conferences, and content to a global community of over 279,000 decision makers and influencers. IIoT World focuses on delivering daily insights on the industrial Internet of Things across multiple verticals. Online IIoT World curates a series of virtual events that draw thousands of delegates. We've all heard Mark Zuckerberg talking and promoting the metaverse. And uh, it's a new thing for consumer technology, a platform for increasing advertising revenue, perhaps. But meanwhile, the manufacturing sector technologists are also exploring uses for the metaverse. The industrial metaverse digitalizes information to transfer them to the worker. Some industrial players already use augmented or mixed reality solutions to reduce error rates, improve training experiences in different areas across value chains. Also, they're using this technology to manage logistics for assembling products as well as for quality control. The question today is, for this session, will the industrial metaverse disrupt global industry? And to find out, we have an excellent panel with a diversity of points of view and uh, technology specializations. And let me give you a quick introduction as we look across the slide. Uh, as GE Digital's Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer, Colin Paris leads collaborative teams to reach across GE to leverage expertise that increases business impact and creates scale advantage for digital transformation. He champions strategic innovation and identifies and evaluates new breakthrough technologies and capabilities to accelerate solutions that solve emerging customer problems. Colin created and now leads the Digital Twin Initiative across GE. Next up is Brian Ballard, Senior Vice President, Solution Delivery at Team Viewer. He's a driven entrepreneur, leader, and technologist focused on solving real problems for the enterprise, making sure that companies deliver quality in everything, that, in everything they do. His current venture upskill, now part of TeamViewer, is working to change the world through wearable technology. And next, Atola Janos is senior manager of Accenture. He started as a mechanical engineer, becoming head of a digital group of 40 by transforming conventional capabilities into innovative building blocks like extended reality, simulation, digital twin, and industrial metaverse. He's currently responsible for DTM strategies, offering development plans, solution architecting, team, and delivery management. So welcome all of you. And with uh, 
this diversity of views, we should have some interesting discussions. Uh, so I thought, first off, you know, disruptive and metaverse is, is, a, is a broad term and it's made up of a whole lot of building blocks. Each of those building blocks in and of itself, I believe, is can be or is disruptive. And I thought maybe we start off by uh, talking about what are the main building blocks we're speaking about uh, when we're talking about the industrial metaverse. And um, I don't know, maybe we could start with Colin and I could say go around, but my screen might be different from yours. So uh, maybe start there and just everybody can pitch in. Okay, well, thank you very much, Gary. It's my true pleasure to be here. So, so when I think about the building blocks, really, I think about sort of six blocks and I'll tell you the categories. The first block is, can I get state that can create the metaphors? So when I look at um, data, I need data coming in. I need IoT to get data from machines. I need 5G for networking. That gives me the state. Then I think about digital twin AI and models. That allows me to get the insights on whatever I'm looking at in our metaverse. Say the metaverse is a metaverse of a factory. And the third thing is all the automation and controls. This allows me, when I get the insights, to do something to the machinery I have. Then the fourth thing I need is AR, VR technologies. This way I can connect the humans so I can now get the insight, do the work with humans as well. Fifth thing, things like crypto blockchain. So can I get the transaction? I did useful work, can I get paid for it? And then the last thing for me are the use cases, right? What are the use cases in which immersion actually gives you the ability to deliver value? So those are the six billion blocks I think of. Anybody else want to chip in with some uh, their, their thoughts on building blocks? I, I think you all have different perspectives. So. Yes, I think uh, uh, Dr. Paris really nailed it too. I mean, we see these exact same issues like, and, and maybe paraphrasing a little bit, like data that is accessible and interconnected is, is obviously a key to this. Um, without that, you have no fabric to, to the industrial metaverse. And I think one of the things that uh, Dr. Paris hit on is, you know, he talked about AR and VR. It's really about having these advanced interfaces for the workforce. And generally that means a form of, of AR or mixed reality for those who are working on say the factory floor or VR for those that need to transport themselves sort of into a different environment than they may be sitting in. But without those, you can't bring the person uh, to that work experience uh, in a way that they can collaborate in an information rich environment. So like these are really important building blocks uh, that we see that without them, uh, it's really business as usual. And I think, you know, if you think about things in terms of the industry 4.0 definition that we've been we've been kind of grappling with over the last decade, really that push into uh, intelligent, interconnected and then enhanced uh, environments really is what brings us into the metaverse versus just a, a new industrial digital twin. Uh, this that's kind of the what that we'll be talking about. And uh, by the way, I see some questions starting to come in and don't forget to use your Q&A button down on your screen to ask questions and we'll get to them. But the next thing I thought maybe we'd talk about uh, is, um, is how, you know, what, how, and then why. Uh, what are the key considerations for harnessing the industrial metaverse? Um, you know, it's one thing to talk about what it is and what the building blocks, but most people listening here want to know how they can get into it and and uh, what are the considerations they'll have to do when they dive into this whole new realm. Um, and I'm not going to pick yeah. on somebody. Uh, somebody have a, a, an answer on that to start us off? Maybe I can go with that. So uh, when it comes to uh, harnessing the, the, the uh, benefits of industry and metaverse, I think real time aspect and the connectivity uh, aspects are important to mention. So you have basically full-time access to a persistent experience, be it your factory, be it your site, be it your plant, but basically you, your, your, your presence is, is uh, 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 there for, for any time you can visit your facility. Enablement of, of uh, simulation uh, uh, methods, uh, for example, on your uh, uh, virtual products or, or, or factories, for future predictions are, are also key and, and something uh, we should think of. And the other is uh, maybe the horizontal integration of, of your um, yeah, operation, maybe we can think of 
from the warehouse to the production line to the uh, site level and the world supply chain aspect. So <clears throat> that's definitely something uh, uh, we can exploit with, with industry and metaverse, although it's in an early stage. So it's about uh, uh, just to shape uh, and find its ways. Maybe I can add to what uh, Attila said, because he gave a great building block there. I, th I think there's macro stuff and there's micro stuff, right? So macro stuff is, you know, you got to get all the, ba we need enough bandwidth, right, um, to get like the real-time data. How do I get that? I mean, I may need 5G to get capabilities. So interconnections, how do you get all these technologies to fuse together in a way that I could actually build an environment and, and as Attila mentioned, have the persistence? How do you get the models to work together? Because I would have a model of a turbine. Somebody might give a model of a generator. Can these two talk? So I think those are standardization things that have to happen in the large scale. And then I think in the smaller scale, you know, I think Dennis said it best. What is the thing that you're doing in your industry? What's the use case that you've got to solve in your industry that you know, based upon this immersive experience, gives you you know, value? Then you do you have the skills in your company to build it? Do you have the data, access to that data? Do you have the rights to that data? So I think those are the kind of things you've got to look at in order to put some of these pieces together. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And and going back to the question of like, what are the key considerations uh, we think about here? I, I think one of the things that, that shouldn't be forgotten is the whole point of the metaverse uh, and the industrial metaverse as well is anyone anywhere in the world can be a participant in this in this metaverse. So space and time are things that we really think about. These are important themes. The real time nature of data matters. And this is why there's such a, a big focus on human interfaces of the future or, or the present, depending on uh, kind of where you think you are in that curve. Um, and also like you know, if you think about uh, everything like GE and, and others have done for the digital twin, like those are about being able to interface these models with real time data of, of objects or processes in the real world. So that space time uh, play is really important. And the second one to me that is a very important consideration, and this uh, maybe ties into some of the questions I can see popping up in the Q&A space, the way you move in and out of these, what are you think of as, as uh, intranets or introverses within the industrial metaverse, security and data exchange really matter. And for me, this is where like blockchain and decentralized authorities come into play. There isn't going to be one sort of overarching metaverse here. There's going to be a lot of data exchanges or people that want to, you know, exchange information with each other or maybe take information, add to it, put that back out in the marketplace. And you need to see where the data is and ensure that there's you know, authenticity uh, along the way and security around that you know, supply chain of information. So. Without those things, um, I don't think the industrial metaverse really has a, a has a future. So it's these are important underpinning uh, things that really need to be well understood for people to take advantage of them. Uh, let me let me probe a little deeper based on some questions I see coming in. Uh, so we talked about building blocks and how we harness it and put it together. And Colin talked about different models and and Brian also in his comments, but. Um, they're, they're asking things like, um, is there going to be a standard, uh, maybe standard data interchanges, maybe, or just walled gardens everywhere? Uh, maybe, you know, rather than looking at the way things are today, what, what do you see coming that, that would address that kind of thing? And actually, um, that, that's a never ending question, right? Because I've been writing about this for 20 years. And it's yep. kind of the, the same thing that comes up. So I'm just curious what you all think of that. Oh, man, we should, you should have a, a poll up where we could each vote on that one. Because um, I, I think, you know, like like the, the real world, everyone's going to have different opinions. But I think a lot of this comes down to purpose. Like the industrial metaverse just, I mean, like it's like cloud. It's a, it is going to become an overloaded term that, that captures a lot of different people's and businesses' goals and motivations. And what you'll see is special purpose things pop up. I mean, like I've got uh, little kids in my house and they go play Roblox, which is often lauded as an example of the metaverse. And man, they can, they go from one very, very different type of experience to another. And I think we're going to see those same things play out on the industrial side where, you know, what a you know uh, beverage bottler is going to need is very different than somebody that makes uh, maybe, uh, you know, heavy industrial equipment. Uh, supply chain people may need something very different than uh, design people. So I think we're going to see a lot of different purposes come up. 
not to call them necessarily walled gardens, but they're going to be, you know, experiences that are very, very different. And you're going to have, I do believe, a, a, a lot of different types of decentralization that are going to enable, hopefully, strong interoperability. Um, even with the internet these days, I mean, like how many people in the audience participate with industry standard groups like OpenXR or maybe Kronos or some of these other, um, these other governing bodies that help knock down some of the interoperability uh, bottlenecks. So at least we have a chance of even interoperating over the internet. So I, I think a lot of these themes are going to keep continuing forward, but there's going to be new technology that helps us do it in a way that allows us to accomplish some of these goals faster. I also think there's some other factors that may show up. So for instance, economics, when I think about, about a wall garden, um, I'm in the energy space. And so if you wanted to actually um, understand how you would build something, a piece of software that would run on the grid, you know, if I have a metaverse in which I have all of the models in which I do generation of power transmission or distribution, why would you go someplace else? Because maybe it's cheaper. I have all these models already, they're connected to the data. You know, and I'm just giving you a flat price. You could run your algorithms. You could see if it works. You're okay. So in that case, the wall garden makes a ton of sense. I am not worried about data security. I get as a somebody trying to write an application that runs on that great benefit from that wall garden. And then I think the other things, if you listen to the discussions um, with maybe the military in the Department of Defense, they would like to have twins of all of the assets they're buying. And they're going to demand from you that you give them a twin every time you sell them anything, whether it be a jet engine, whether it be a certain type of military equipment. And so you're going to have to obey their standards in order to fit into their system. And their standards are all around not only interoperability, but zero trust. So I think you'll have a combination of both being built. And then I really hope what you know <laughs> was said before, that we have an open source movement in which we try to do, do it all, because I think that's the way you get human ingenuity showing up. Good. Any other? Also, yeah. my, my two cents, it's really that uh, everybody is, is trying to figure out how their metaverse is looking like, but ultimately it should be one at the end, like, because at the end, metaverse is kind of evolution of the internet. And as it is one internet only, there should be one industrial metaverse or one metaverse at the end. You're, you're talking about building blocks that sort of like starts with data. And, and uh, I think it was Brian earlier on mentioned Industry 4.0, uh, and a lot of that had to do, I don't hear the term anymore, cyber physical systems, but uh, Colin has talked about digital twins. So we've got data, we've got the digital asset and the physical asset, if you will, and uh, we need to bring them all together. Maybe we bring them all together with a headset. I don't know. Uh, I, I've personally, because I'm a writer and I go talk to a lot of people, I've tried on all kinds of headsets and glasses and so on. And um, I'm just fascinated by uh, those building blocks that are going on too. A lot of stuff coming together and maybe it just needs to continue. Uh, to, to move us a little bit, um, and you could keep the questions coming. There are a lot of good questions coming and it's gonna be tough for us to try to answer them, but I'll try to weave them in. But let's talk about impact a little bit. What do you think is the biggest impact on the industry? Stepping back a little bit and saying, ah, oh, now we've got all this technology and we're putting it together and we're putting the building blocks together. Um, you know, it's kind of a little bit like, why should management care? What's the impact? What's going to happen? And I'm not sure who to ask first. So I don't know if somebody's prepared and wants to jump in. Maybe I can, I can start. One of the biggest impacts is the way of collaboration. I think all across the employees, but all across uh, the, the supply chain with vendors and, and uh, other partners. So that will definitely uh, 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 change. And uh, the way that remote assistance and, and field workers maybe uh, can be uh, uh, triggered and supported by AR, VR uh, solutions, that, that's something new. Also the, the, the way of uh, uh, designing uh, products, maybe just taking an example that uh, uh, instead of working with clays and, and creating a lot of waste management, uh, waste, waste uh, 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 production, um, you are able to do early design reviews in the, on the, your virtual product, um, uh, do some testing on your virtual prototype, 
and so on. That leads to the uh, point of, of sustainability as well for me, at least. And uh, last but not least, the training uh, uh, aspects, uh, like having uh, pe our people or having uh, employees uh, trained virtually in a safe environment, uh, maybe much more cheaper, maybe across the globe, across countries, uh, is, is, is also, or having them trained or on even a non-existing uh, product or machine or, or operation. That uh, that definitely uh, something we can exploit uh, from here. Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely think employee engagement is going to be an incredibly interesting area to to look at. I, it, it's almost sort of one of these things just kind of expected. Whichever metaverse definition you're looking at, the the more consumer commercial one or or the or the industrial one, it really is going to be like, how does an employee change their engagement model? Like uh, you just heard about like the training aspect of it. We can have a more rich understanding of the job we're going to do, the things we're going to work on um, with these new training tools. Um, we're going to have better collaboration and connectivity between different people and different skill sets within the workforce because we're just going to blow away the constraints of, of space and, and presence. Um, and then the thing that's like really interesting to me is like as we go from sort of the industrial revolution style of of uh, human capital, where like we're just trying to stamp out people that fit into like this this nice neat little job definition into one where people can really collaborate, and you bring in the power of like AI and using some of these models that that you've heard Dr. Paris talk about, and adding collaborative insights into these engagements is just going to be, I think, a really exciting time to work and a, and a, a medium in which to engage. So for me, employee engagement is a number one, and it just creates so many uh, kind of interesting secondary effects. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, with both Brian and Attila. The, um, the two things I think about right now, maybe it's because I live it so much, is I look at the challenge we have with inflation and supply chain and labor. So when I think about inflation and supply chain right now in our factories, I've got to find a way to, to deal with the fact that the cost of raw materials may be so high or their scarcity that I have to retool my line or even maybe redesign pieces of my product. How fast can I do that? Mm. If I have a, a, a metaverse and I can do some level of simulation with people being immersive because I've got a human process in it, then maybe I could retool this thing fast enough to deal with the fact that I no longer can get you know, this material or maybe I can't get it in this time or this price point. Second is labor. Uh, you know, um, there are extreme labor shortages right now and quite a few people are retiring, whether it is the you know great retirement or it's the quiet quitting, you have less talent how do I train them fast enough to, to Brian's point? And then maybe I just don't need to use the metaverse to train people. Maybe I can need to need to use them to train robots or robots and people. Because when I look at the productivity I need right now, we have moved from China to Vietnam to Bangladesh to actually get a reduction in cost, you know, of um, you know, labor costs. But the reality is with rising food and rising fuel prices, that is going to be gone soon. So maybe that's got to be used to train people where you are fast or train robots. So I think all of these things come together. Uh, I thought maybe we might move on. Uh, we've talked a lot about building blocks and, and some of these new things. But um, uh, I, usually when somebody's presenting to me, you know, I, I get, you know, I, I talk to people like Colin and, and other people. And, and so I'll say, you know, why should I care? And uh, I, I kind of get into that, but stepping back and looking at a, at a broader business perspective, what are some of the benefits that uh, industrial companies or power companies or, or, or whatever the business might be, what are the, the business benefits, what are the benefits people would get from even playing with all these ideas? Um, or are we just like talking because we're technologists and we love to talk technology? Uh, I don't know. So what do you think about that? me a lot of it is quality precision um and when we think about like if there's models and intelligence that we're bringing into to the equation the better and more in interconnected the more accurate the more use of data we have the more like feedback loops we have from what's happening in the world to the digital twin i think 
more and more over time, the products and services that we produce begin to behave exactly as they were intended rather than um, based on best guess um, and best knowledge uh, prior to the production process. So I think that has a lot of uh, downstream effects in terms of, um, you know, what you what, what we might bin that as, you know, better mean time between failure, better cost, better ROI. But ultimately, it's we're creating much better products uh, that perform as intended. I love what my colleagues said, because I think they're all right. I think um, the cost aspect of it is massive one, given what we face in the next few years. I, I also think the innovation aspect becomes huge, right? So every industry I know it's in transition, there's an energy transition, there's a manufacturing transition going on because of the geopolitical constraints. There's a transition going on, you know, in, in all aspects of, of um, transportation in many ways. And so part of the challenge is how do you apply innovation now? You can't just throw dollars because you have these really high interest rates. How do you get innovation? And how do you do it quickly and effectively? And, you know, maybe as, you know, we discussed, the metaverse is that type of sandbox where I can go in. And not only can I, you know, innovate and, you know, get a product built, but I can tie it to the supply chain to see if it works. Then imagine a situation where, the, the metaverse itself watches me try to put together design. And when I leave the metaverse, all the AI in the background continues generating designs and throwing it out at me. You know, so again, I come back the next morning, there are 15 designs, 10 of them are rubbish, right? They don't work in the real world, but five of them might have a nugget that may make sense. So that discussion Brian had before about time, maybe it's a way to compress time. And if you could compress time and cost, whoever does, does that well wins. So I think it's a massive change if you can do it. I really like what, what, what Colin said, because for me also metaverse is really about persistency. And really, if you step out, it should keep going on and, and, and things should happen inside. And, and when we talk about benefits, I, I think it's also worth to mention the power of analytics that we can exploit. So if we come to the, uh, for example, back to training, we just deployed the, uh, the training uh, uh, application for one of the robotics clients. And, uh, you know, if you are doing trainings in physical versus doing trainings in, in immersive way, you can track the performance of the employee. You can get the analytics on, I don't know, hesitation time, which were the type of exercises he or she was struggling with. So you can adjust your education uh, uh, system later on on that. And that's never mm, happening when you are doing a, a physical training with a real trainer. He cannot really judge on that. So that's that's the power of analytics, what we only can do in, in the industrial metaverse. Good. The title of this session has to do with disruption. Um, and sometimes I could put on my cynic hat and say, okay, every marketing person that sends me a press release includes disruption in there somewhere. But um, actually, I think this this could be uh, very well disruptive to the way we've been doing uh, industry. And I'm just curious for your thoughts, as we've been talking about all these different aspects of um, of this, this topic, uh, what, what do you see that's disruptive or is it, is it that disruptive or just a little bit additive or is it just going to change the way we're doing things? Um, so I'm, I'm curious, you guys are really right out there. So what are your thoughts? Well, I think, um, just to define this, like we, uh, in a past life, I used to work with a, a group that was looking for for disruption in a 10, 20, 40 year um, horizon. And, and one of the things that they used to define disruption is is true surprise. Like when it happens, you're you're really shocked by it. And I, I not to to downplay it a little bit, but I, th I think because there is going to be so much work between companies to pull this off and it's there's just a lot of technology that's that's underway. I don't think we'll be so much surprised when it happens, but I think we will be surprised by maybe some of the outcomes um, between those that adopt and those that don't. And I think, you know, areas that we'd see there is, uh, you know, customer experience, for instance, will be, I think, a mile wide gap between those that engage in it and those that that don't. And I think you'll see that through product quality. I think you'll see it through engagement models where how you support your supply chain, your buyers and, and your vendors 
Um, I, I do think that will be a night and day difference. So that, that's one I've got my eyes on. Yeah, just, just Dennis was mentioning the visual inspection and I liked it. And, and if it's disruption, I'm sure you know, know the, the, um, uh, this antibiotics robotic dogs doing these 3D scans. And NVIDIA came up with a nice example of, of putting them in, into Omniverse and you know, teaching them how to work on this uneven terrain. And uh, they put like hundreds of uh, robotic dogs on the terrain and, and they were taught like in 20 minutes while <laughs> it, 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 uh, separately uh, on their own, it's like four or five days needed. Uh, so applying machine learning uh, in that and really reducing the teaching time at that level is, is something I call the disruption. Yeah, uh, so, so I, I actually think it will be very disruptive. I think um, I think disruption, a technology can cause disruption, but when you have a technology causing disruption, plus you have external forces forcing disruption, I think you get that perfect storm. If I look at things like what's happening with you know, global politics, right? You're at a point now where, you know, some manufacturing has to be back here just simply because you're not sure of the supply chain. Plus there are all these new government mandates on what can and cannot leave. And so with that and the cost problem that's coming from the high interest rates, you have to react. And so smart people are gonna find smart solutions. I see people talk about the metaverse using that as a simulation platform. And then immediately what you do is you take all that information because the good thing is that you everything is digitized in time and space in the metaverse. And they're trying to send it off to you know additive platforms where the additive machine builds the part right away. And because of this time that you can, you can do this in milliseconds and then you can recorrect at every level of the layer, you know, as you test and you find out that the part didn't have this level of, of um, fidelity or performance, because you could do, you could simulate this stuff when you get a piece of the part, the cycle of that happening, and it's all done in a certain way at that speed and that price point, I think somebody is going to have to do it, you know, and once you get it done, it's a winner take all. It's the same way that the Amazons, the Googles and the Apple showed up. And everybody's got to figure out that I need to be that winner. So I'm going to bet hard. So I think disruption is going to happen one way or the other. You all, I think all of you have touched on, on a, a term called efficiency and maybe a couple of other things. We had an, an interesting question come up in the Q&A about uh, productivity. Productivity is always in the news and, and certain economists or other people bemoan the fact that we just don't have, we haven't had an increase of productivity in a long time. Uh, I wonder if anybody here could speak to you know, is the metaverse going to help us in our productivity? I mean, you know, Colin talked about, uh, and, and all of you know, to a to degree, about getting people and some of productivity is how much stuff we can get out per, per man hour and all that sort of thing. Uh, so so where where is this going to take us? Are we going to break that little log jam of productivity and, and see a little uh, little better increase there? For the training aspect, definitely. So you might know the cone of experience saying that uh, after two weeks, uh, we only remember 10% out of what we read, 20% of what we heard, 30 what we said, what, what we saw. And then it, it comes down that it 90% can be retained if you do something and, 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 and say something. So having that term, conducting trainings and operations or, or maintenance instructions in the metaverse would definitely uh, 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 lead to a higher higher productivity productivity level. Hmm. Uh, I, I agree with that. I think the, the training of people, uh, one dimension, the training of robots, the other dimension, because most factories now are automating. The, again, because of the constraints you have on the planet right now and the fact that you can't go to a, a, a low cost infrastructure anywhere in the world, you're gonna to automate people and humans. The second thing I think is planning. Uh, one of the reasons why we have low productivity is that we plan for a world in which a lot of things didn't, you know, didn't change. And so when you put a factory and you spend capital to put in factories and everything else, you, know, you can't change those easily. But right now with the right planning systems and the metaverse would be a great one where you could simulate a number of things you know, and actually bring in governments to help you simulate. So, you know, you can get the laws right, you can get the investment right. Now we can, you know, build for, you know, throughput and flexibility. 
so that when things change on the planet, you can adapt faster. And if you can adapt faster, then you'll see the productivity rise because half the time I have these embedded costs that I can't get out. And so when you measure productivity, you'll see a lot of those things come into play. So I think the planning aspect of it is also a very powerful aspect of it. Uh, another interesting question, in fact, this popped up uh, several times on the Q&A, um, has to do with uh, another really big current topic, sustainability, you can call it, or environmental impacts, uh, that sort of thing. And curiosity amongst uh, our viewers is uh, what impact will this have on the sustainability uh, efforts of most manufacturers? Do you have thoughts on that? Definitely. Um, yeah, I, I think there's there's a couple areas. One is um, just the power of being able to collaborate remotely, um, the amount of jet fuel you save and not having to fly people out, drive people out to, to site to bring an expert technician in. If you can use uh, mixed reality as a, or augmented reality as a way to help uh, debug something, I think these are these are really obvious ones. Um, there's there's the counter effects of you know what does it cost in telecommunications infrastructure etc. But I think the data that that most of us have seen suggests that this is definitely still a, a a fairly big net positive in terms of sustainability. And then it comes into like you know our designs like you know take the take aviation fuel like could we design a better fuel? Can we design things that are more sustainable? Can we develop more products that uh, you know can break through some of the physics barriers that have been been holding us back? So. I think that that's you know the the march of progress that's that's being made right now. Um, but there are things that are happening like today we're getting benefit from, and that's I think a lot of that has to do with the the power of remote collaboration. Fully agree with Brian. Maybe adding one point: the the uh, think about the brownfield extension of a factory, for example. So lot of uh, misdirections or, 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 or pitfalls can be avoided with the power of simulating in advance. So no need to uh, run on, on, on barriers and, 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 and problems uh, because basically you can get your design uh, 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 finalized and fixed and, and properly before the commissioning and installation. Yeah. Also in manufacturing, when you look right now at the at the board level, everyone thinks about sustainability in terms of what is an ESG. So scope one, scope two, scope three emissions. Scope one are the emissions that I throw out. Scope two is, you know, the support things. I have trucks and everything else. What's that? And scope three really is my supply chain. What are the emissions they throw out? How do I actually know that? In a metaverse, maybe it might be the first way I can look at the entire ecosystem, my factory all the way out of my supply chain, each of us putting in models, and we can sit together and we can say, these are the best objectives that we can have collectively, because I think sustainability is an ecosystem problem on the planet. It's not just one company, and we can say, okay, I'll do this. If I do this with these materials, then you know, you can have the lowest amount of carbon coming in from the raw materials coming to me and then the other integrators have pieces and then finally me as a the, the ultimate integrator, you know, I can have the lowest carbon. So I think it's vital in sustainability. So the metaverse could have us plan this, it could have us operationalize this, when there are bugs, we could debug it. So I think it's a great tool to use. We only have a few minutes, uh, you know, maybe three, four minutes uh, left. So I don't want to ask too broad of a question, but uh, maybe you could, um, we, we've talked an awful lot about potentials in future and a little bit about the way things are coming, but maybe a sentence or two on uh, a little more practical aspect. What did, What's limiting adoption right now, uh, notwithstanding that in the future, of course, technologists will uh, overcome them, but uh, before people go running out uh, right away, uh, is there like one one limiting factor you see that uh, people should be aware of? And like I said, we only have a few minutes. So, oh man, uh, I was gonna say like we can just give people like an index into a, a much bigger discussion. Like look look at the challenges with uh, IT OT convergence around system discontinuity access, uh, and that that's a, that's gonna peel back a lot of layers of the onions. But but to me, that's that's the starting point. We would also add uh, uh, aspects like security, computing, power, 
uh, connectivity because if we really uh, imagine the the best metaverse, then then uh, you should consider that everywhere is 5G and that the available, which is not the case, of course, on the field and so on. So these are definitely some gaps to be filled still. I think we could we could spend hours listing the gaps, but I think the solution is that one or two early adopters who get the use case and get this thing done. It's amazing. After you saw the Amazon and Googles of the world do it, everybody quickly said, wow, we can get that done too. And everyone rushed to it. That's how the world works, right? You can't be left behind. So those first few leaders who get this right, I think, you know, the rest of the gaps will get bridged and make money. You know, it's always the and make money part. It's true. Uh, in, in my discussions with a lot of people, uh, senior levels, um, they complain that the engineers come in and talk about KPIs or, you know, I can add this piece to the computer and they, they ignore the fact that um, if we don't make a profit, we're not going to be in business. So uh, sort of have to do that. And Brian, I appreciated your comment about ITOT convergence. I built my whole fourth uh, um, career on uh, ITOT. It's the manufacturing connection it had to do with connecting. So uh, yeah, that that's definitely something that uh, is is still still ongoing, but it's getting better. Yeah, it's definitely not a finished project, right? <laughs> Once again, a journey. And I think, uh, I think uh, industrial metaverse is a journey. Um, it's not necessarily a single thing. It's putting together from the digitalization and digitizing all the way up to uh, these use cases we've talked about. So uh, I'd like to wrap up. I'd like to thank all the the, uh, the panelists for um, for for coming and sharing their insights. Uh, they were very very interesting. Um, I see a session rating just popped up on my screen. So please uh, please add your comments to that. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors again. Without the sponsors, it's not possible to put these on. And our sponsors for uh, for this session. Uh, Dark Pulse, GE Digital, Intel, Hitachi Ventera, Ursa Leo, and Siemens. Um, their support ensures that we have all this great content to share, and we appreciate that. And thanks to all of you for listening in and for all your great questions. Uh, I tried to get to as many as I could and, uh, and tried to get that all uh, answered. Fantastic. Really appreciate it. And we'll give you time to get to the next session, uh, which is called Include Industrial Metaverse Features in Your Existing IoT Platform. That should be, uh, once again, another very interesting topic. So thanks to all of you for, uh, for, for your support and, and for your uh, comments. And I appreciated meeting all of you virtually anyway. That's part of the metaverse, I guess. And thanks to everything else. Um, and uh, thank you and have a great day.